Jesus so loved you and I that He was willing not just to go through external pain, but to experience bruising and pain beneath the surface to show us that there is no pain unseen that Jesus Himself doesn't understand and hasn't Himself walked through. He is the kind of guy that we can bring our visible pain to and our unseen pain to, and He can make a difference all the same. Today, we're going to continue a message series that we kicked off last Sunday called Bloodlines. Uh, We are on the lead up to Good Friday. And uh, if you're new to church, maybe this morning you've, you've been a little bit freaked out in the sense that there's all these weird, happy kind of people with smiles on their faces singing about blood and Jesus' death. If you're unfamiliar with church, I could understand that that would be a little bit odd. If you are familiar with church, do you know how strange you are? Because it's a weird thing, right? Not Normally, if you're to reflect upon a person's death, it would be in a sombre tone, which would be fitting. But here are all these people today, and they've got big smiles on their faces, singing about it. In fact, we don't just call it Easter Friday, we call it Good Friday, Uh, I wonder why that is. It's because of this. When you and I understand not just the fact that Jesus died upon the cross, but we understand why he suffered and died and and what he was accomplishing in that act, it ceases to just be Easter Friday and it comes into focus. We realise that it's actually Good Friday because we understand the purpose for which Jesus died. And so in this series, we're talking about the, the bloodline of Scripture Uh, from cover to cover. And so last Sunday morning, we kicked off the series and talked about that theme through Scripture and what it means for our life. And then last Sunday night, we talked about uh, Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before He died, when He prayed, Father, not my will, but let Thy will be done. And His sweat became like great drops of blood. We talked about that last Sunday night. Well, this morning, we're going to continue the series and we're going to talk about the second and third blood shedding of Christ. Now, now let me explain that. In the 24 hours before Jesus died, from his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane to his death upon the cross on the hill of Calvary, Jesus' blood was shed seven times. And each of those seven blood sheddings of Jesus has significance and meaning for our lives. And uh, this morning, actually, I forgot to mention, we've got notes. If you've got the Bible app, you can uh, scan that QR code on screen and if you've got the Version Bible app, and uh, the notes will come straight to your device, and uh, that way you can follow along with the message or um, bring it up on your device again at Connect Group this week and talk about the message in your Connect Group. But we want to talk about what Jesus was doing and what Jesus was accomplishing through his second and third bloodletting. Now, some of you are thinking, man, this feels a little bit tone deaf. I've come to a kid's building opening, isn't it meant to be like fairy floss and stuff today? And you're talking about bloodletting? I, I know it feels a bit tone deaf, but, but I promise you it's going to be happy by the end of this sermon, all right? There will be barbecue and, and fairy floss at the end, and you are going to see how this actually is a cause for joy. But, but this is where we are in our series, and, and I do think it's going to really help us today. You know, many people, when they see a cross, they think about it as a type of sentimental religious symbol. I was talking to one of our staff this week and I didn't know, I found out one of our staff has actually got a tattoo of a cross on his rib cage. And I thought, man, he is so devoted. And uh, turns out he actually got it before he was a Christian. He was out partying with the boys and was drunk one night and got it tattooed on his rib cage to try and impress a girl. And, uh, and so some people, they, they see the cross and they just think it's, it's sentimental. You might see a cross around a necklace or a cross atop a church building. But but the Bible actually says that the cross is the place where the power of God has been displayed for you and I. So, So the cross of Jesus is not just sentimental, but the cross of Jesus actually has great power when you understand what was being accomplished at the cross. And so we're going to talk about this second and third bloodshedding of Jesus and what it means for our lives. And so the second bloodshedding of Jesus was his scourging at the whipping post. And the third was when Jesus was beaten and bruised, which of course triggered internal 
bleeding. And so we're going to look at these two scenes, not in isolation, but we're going to consider them together because I think they're meant to be seen side by side. Now, before we jump into that scene and read those portions of the Bible, um, let, me just, let me just say this. Um, how many people would say at some point in your life you've experienced pain? Just give us a wave. Some people not lifting their hands. I would love to be you. Um, we, we've all experienced pain. Now, I've observed that pain tends to enter our lives through one of two avenues. The, the first avenue by which pain enters our life, sometimes we experience pain because of the decisions or the actions of other people. Isn't it true that sometimes we suffer because other people made choices? Your neighbour chose to listen to country music and, and you had to suffer because they kept their windows open. You can suffer because of the choices of other people. That's one of the ways pain comes into our life. But, but another way that pain comes into our life is, is not through the choices and actions of others, but through our own choices and actions. Anyone here today honest enough to admit I've made some dumb decisions in my life that have been pain-inducing? We, we would all be honest enough to say that. And so you can't just say that all pain is the fault of others, because sometimes pain is because of our own mist mistakes, our own choices. The, the Bible would say it this way, because of our own sin or faults or lousy attitudes. And so I, I want you to hold that thought because we're going to come back to that later in the message. Now, let's go to the scene of Jesus' most painful 24 hours. Jesus, um, the night before he was crucified, he shares the last supper with his disciples. And then Judas scurries off to betray Jesus for 30 pieces. I just like the word scurries. He scurries off to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And Jesus and the other 11 disciples go to a garden where they used to hang out regularly. It was called Gethsemane. And uh, Jesus in the garden prays. And then after he prays, Judas comes with a, a mob, a, a mob of Roman soldiers or a Roman guard who are armed with clubs and swords to arrest Jesus. Then Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss on the cheek. And then Jesus is arrested and he's dragged off to stand trial. First, he stands trial before the Jewish religious uh, court, before the high priest. And then he stands trial before Pontius Pilate, who was the judicial or the government authority of the day. And then we get to Mark 15, verse 15. It'll come up on screen. It says, so Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Uh, John says it more concisely in his gospel. He simply says, then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And, and, and here is the second point at which Jesus shed his blood for you and I. Now, the Bible doesn't go into great detail to explain scourging, presumably because the first century audience or recipients or, or readers were well and truly familiar with what scourging entailed. But, but you and I less so. If, if you're the kind of person who gets a little bit squeamish at some of this stuff, just hold your neighbor's hand. Um, for all the single young guys, I gave you a gift. And so to be scourged, also to be flogged, was, was horrific. Uh, it was a cruel punishment. It was normally handed out as the prelude to being crucified. Uh, the purpose of scourging was not just to cause physical pain, it was also to inflict humiliation upon its victim. Uh, it was so brutal and degrading that if you were a Roman citizen, you were exempt from ever receiving this penalty. Uh, the, the victim of scourging would be stripped naked and then have their hand shackled around a post or a frame and then they would be flogged from the shoulders down to the calf muscles with a leather whip and at the end of that leather whip there were pieces of bone and lead so that as the whip came down onto the victim's body the bone and the metal would sink deep into the skin and then on the way out the bone and the, the lead would tear through the skin and rip out blood vessels and nerves and muscles, leaving bloody holes in, in the side and the back of the victim and leaving the bones and the intestines exposed. Uh, the church historian Eusebius of Caesarea, he writes of this um, uh, scene of scourging. He, he says this, it'll be on screen. They say that the bystanders were struck with amazement when they saw them lacerated with scourges, even to the innermost veins and arteries, so that the hidden inward parts of the body, both their bowels and their members, were exposed 
to view. Uh, when Mel Gibson released the movie The Passion of the Christ, some people complained that it was too bloody and gruesome. But the reality is Mel Gibson probably toned down the gore of the scene. Uh, king David, one of Israel's most famous kings, he wrote psalms or, or poetry. And, and some of those psalms were prophetic in nature. They looked ahead to events that were still to come. Uh, one of them, the 22nd Psalm, it is called a Messianic Psalm. It's a foreshadowing of what would take place to this Messiah figure. And uh, when we understand the detail of scourging, it helps us to make sense of something that I've read but never understood in the Bible. Psalm 22, verse 17, David, not writing of himself, but writing of this figure who was to come, David said, all my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. It wasn't the crucifixion that caused Jesus' bones to be on display. It was the flogging that likely exposed his ribs so that when Jesus hung upon the cross, his bones were all on display. Uh, the scourging didn't merely lay stripes on Jesus' back, but, but it did far more than that. It, his back would have been torn to ribbons, his ribs fractured. Uh, by the time the Roman guard were done, it, his lungs would have been bruised, he would have had bleeding into his chest cavity, and his liver and spleen would have been lacerated. The victims of scourging would periodically vomit as their body went into shock. They would experience tremors, seizures, and descend into hypovolemic shock from the loss of of fluids. Is everyone still with us? I told you this is going to get worse before it gets better. Stay with me. Um, it's often said that Jesus was lashed 39 times before he was crucified, but, but that's probably not the case, and it's certainly not in the Bible. Uh, Jewish law stated that a criminal could be lashed 40 times, and so to ensure that they weren't breaking the law, the, Jewish, the Jews had a moral code that you would be lashed up to 39 times, but but no more. How sensitive of them. And yet Jesus wasn't scourged or flogged by the Jewish authorities. He was flogged by the Roman authorities and they had no such mercy law. And so he was most likely flogged far more than 39 times. He was flogged within an inch of his life. They probably only stopped when he was near death. And Jesus was so beaten, so bloodied, so reduced by the flogging and the scourging, that as a 33-year-old in the prime of his life, he, he was unable to carry the crossbeam from the whipping post to Calvary's hill where he would be crucified. And so make no doubt about it, Jesus suffered and bled when he was scourged. Some historians say that when a victim was bound to the whipping post, they were expected to confess their crime. Do you remember as a kid back in the old days when parents didn't believe in timeouts, they believed in, you know, lighter forms of, punish, of capital punishment. Um, do you remember you, your parents might threaten you with a smack and what happened when, when dad threatened? The truth came out. Anyone, anyone grow up in one of those households? It, it wasn't timeout, it was knockout. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. But, but as a kid, like if you got threatened with pain, the truth suddenly comes out. Well, well historians say that when a, a, a criminal would be shackled to the whipping post, they would be expected to start confessing their crime. And, and if they confessed their crimes, then the Roman guard would ease up on the scourging and the beating. But, but think about this, Jesus was innocent. He had no crime to confess. And, and so that's why Isaiah, writing 700 years prior of Jesus, said he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And, and so when Jesus was flogged, he, he didn't open his mouth. It, it, it wasn't that he was, you know, engaging in some kind of silent protest. It was that he had no sin to confess. He was innocent. He had committed no crime, and, and yet he endured the punishment. And, and so the Roman guard would not have eased up at all on the scourging. And, and so this is the second of Jesus' seven blood sheddings. Let's go to the, the third. It says in Mark 14 and verse 65 that then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him and struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. And so the third time that Jesus bled was when he was beaten and bruised. Mark 15 verse 18 says they began to salute Jesus saying, hail king of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And so when Jesus was struck and beaten, 
beneath the surface of his skin, that beating would have caused a bruise. Anyone here, you've ever had a, like a, an, an immunization, a needle in your shoulder, and then within a day or two, some so-called friend comes up and goes, hey, how are you? They punch you on the shoulder. Anyone ever had that? And, and what happens, because they can't see it, there's no blood that they can see, but beneath the surface, it's bruised. And when you're bruised, beneath the surface, there's internal bleeding. And so they just kind of tap your shoulder and you react. Why? Because when you're, maybe you've had a corky playing rugby or sport. When you're bruised, your body is bleeding. It's just that the naked eye can't see it. And I'm really grateful that Jesus was willing not just to bleed visibly, but Jesus was willing to be bruised and to bleed beneath the surface. Because the reality is, there'd be a lot of us in church today who right now, on the surface, how's life? Awesome, so good, never been better, amazing. But beneath the surface, there's pain. Do you know what I'm talking about today? Beneath, you, you, can, you can be knocked by the bumps and bruises of other people's decisions. Maybe a rejection, maybe a broken marriage vow, maybe a, a redundancy, maybe words spoken that were unkind. The reality is that all of us know what it is to be hurting beneath the surface and to experience pain that nobody else can see. Some of us are experiencing this right now, and that's why you're just looking kind of straight ahead because you don't want to make eye contact with anyone in the room because you know what it is to carry pain beneath the surface of your life. I am so grateful that Jesus so loved you and I, that he was willing not just to go through external pain, but to experience bruising and pain beneath the surface to show us that there is no pain unseen that Jesus himself doesn't understand understand and hasn't himself walked through. He is the kind of guy that we can bring our visible pain to and our unseen pain to, and he can make a difference all the same. Don't you love that about Jesus? And so we, we see these second and third occasions that Jesus bled between Gethsemane and Calvary. And so to understand what that actually means for us, we need to go back in the Bible to an Old Testament Jewish prophet. His name was Isaiah. I mentioned him before. He lived about 700 BC, but he, he spoke and he wrote this foreshadowing of what this suffering figure, ultimately fulfilled by Jesus, would endure. And what I, what I appreciate about the text we're about to read is that Isaiah kind of gives us the 30,000 foot perspective. Ever been up in a plane, you look out the window and you get a whole different perspective from 30,000 feet. You see it all in context. Well, what Isaiah does is he gives us the 30,000 feet perspective on what's going on when Jesus went to the whipping post and when Jesus was beaten. Isaiah wrote in verse four, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed, literally means bruised. He was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds, we are healed. Matt mentioned that earlier. We like sheep, what a compliment. <laughs> we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, where Isaiah said, this is what's going to happen when Jesus is bruised and when Jesus is whipped and when Jesus receives stripes on his back, you and I are going to be healed. When I read that, I think that's magnificent. But the obvious question is healed of what? A, a headache? Healed of a common flu? Healed of bad habits? What, what's, what's Jesus going to heal us of through his flogging and through his bruising? Well, Isaiah actually, if you look through the verses a little more closely, Isaiah actually tells us what Jesus is going to heal us of. There's two pairs that I want us to see. Firstly, it says, he took up our pain and our suffering, our pain and our suffering. Remember earlier, I said there's two ways that pain comes into our life. The first way that pain comes into our life is via suffering. Other people make choices and decisions and we suffer as a consequence. Well, Isaiah first said that Jesus took upon himself our pain and suffering, but then secondly, it says he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. Now, that needs a little bit of defining because who knows transgressions is not a word that you use much 
today. Like, I don't think any of us post-service in the foyer are going to say, oh, yes, I'm a bit concerned about the transgressions of the young people in Townsville. Trans- it's, it's a bit of an old school word. So, so what does transgressions actually mean? It means to rebel or it means to revolt. Iniquities literally means to bend or to twist or to distort or to do wrong. And, and so here's the reality. Whether or not you call yourself religious, isn't it true that all of us actually have first-hand experience with both forms of pain. All of us would say, you know what, I know what it is to experience pain and suffering because of other people's choices. And if we're going to be honest for at least three seconds, all of us would say, I see within myself that sometimes there are things that I do where I think I know better than God. There are things that I do that are wrong. There are things that I do that aren't perfect. And so uh, what we have is we realize that all of us ourselves and other people in our world, all of us know what it is to experience these two forms of pain. Now, there's a, a common thought trend in our culture these days, and if you've been in university in the last five years, you, you'll probably be familiar with it, that society can be gro- broken up into two groups. You've got the oppressors and you've got the oppressed. You've got the sinners and you've got the sinned against. You've got the villains and you've got the victims. And, uh, you know, we, we break people into one of those two groups based on their skin color, ethnicity, religion, gender, lifestyle. We, we tend to, it's called critical theory, this idea that everyone is either a sinner or sinned against, but, but not both. The reality is, if, if we're really honest, all of us actually know that we are both sinners and sinned against. We are both villains and victims at the same time. We are both oppressed and oppressors. If I was to stand up here today and say, I've never done any wrong, just I only suffer because of the decisions of other people, my wife would grab the mic and just fill in the blanks for you. (laughs) And don't let me put the mic in your spouse's hand, right? Because the reality is, I can't look at other people and say, all the pain in my life is because of them. that's, That's blind. The reality is, there's dysfunction in the world, and D. Bell contributes to it. Thanks for not amening too loudly at that point. Hey, you contribute to it as well. Isn't it true that both of us actually fall into both of these categories? We can all relate to these two types of pain, the pain that comes via the sin of others and the pain that we bring on ourselves via our own sin. That's the human experience. All of us experience pain and suffering that strikes from without And all of us know what it is to to wrestle with the transgressions and iniquities that flow from within. Is everyone still following me so far this morning? I've had two coffees and I'm jacked. And so so, so let's, let's do a thought exercise. Let's imagine there is a God. Go with me. Let's imagine there is a God. And let's imagine that this God had a desire to bring healing to people's lives. If this God was going to heal our lives, this God would need to provide healing that is twofold. This God would need to be able to firstly deal with the healing that's required inside of us because of our iniquities and transgressions. But secondly, this God would need to provide healing from the pain that comes from the sins of others. In other other words, there is a twofold problem which needs a twofold cure. And this is exactly what Jesus accomplished for you and I. I said before that Isaiah looked forward to the cross of Jesus, but one of the early church leaders, Peter, he wrote a portion of the Bible. He looked back on the suffering and death of Jesus, and he wrote this. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. What's that? That's Jesus taking our pains and bearing up under suffering. But then it goes on. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. And so Jesus was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. But not only that, he also suffered and endured because of our pain, which means this, the twofold 
cause of pain that you and I experience is met with a twofold solution in the person of Jesus. Jesus didn't just suffer so that you and I could be forgiven because what good is it to be forgiven if you're still bruised beneath the surface? What good is it to be forgiven if you're still hurting on the inside? Jesus, knowing our human condition, knowing what would be required for our healing, didn't just endure suffering, he bore our sin. He didn't just bear our sin, he endured our suffering, which means this, there is nothing that you have done that so disqualifies you from Jesus' love and grace because he took our iniquities and he took our transgressions upon the cross. There is no sin that you have done. There is nothing in your past that cannot be healed by the forgiving grace of Jesus. I don't know about you, but that's good news for me because I I need forgiveness. If there's a God up there, I need forgiveness. But, but, But not only that, you don't just have to be forgiven but hurt for the rest of your life. Because Jesus not only dealt with the pain that we bring upon ourselves, Jesus shared in our suffering so that when you and I get bruised, when you and I get hurt by the bumps and the knocks of life, we have a God who knows what it is himself to be bruised. Listen, your picture of God, is everyone still with me so far today? I've got four more hours to go. That's not true. The team have given me nine minutes and 40 seconds. So, so they, I, sometimes they accelerate the clock, which hurts, but it's fine. So, so, so what that means is this, your picture of God will determine how willing you are to actually make an approach to Jesus. Some of us have got this picture of Jesus, and maybe you're in church today for the first time, and this is your picture of Jesus. Life is hard, and Jesus came to add suffering to my suffering. Like, life is already pretty painful, but, but if I come to God and open my heart to Him, He's going to pour more pain on pain, because we have this picture of God that God is waiting with a bony finger to point it in our face and and judge us and and, and inflict suffering upon us for all of our wrongdoing. Who knows, when you see Jesus flogged at the whipping post, when you see Jesus beaten and bruised, when you see Jesus outstretched upon the cross, it changes your picture of God. Because if that is what God is like, then when I have got suffering, when I've got pain, when I've got guilt on my conscience, I don't need to avoid that kind of God. I could actually open my heart and approach that kind of God because number one, he's got firsthand experience of pain. But number two, apparently he's come to forgive me and deal with my iniquity. Is this making sense today? The two common things that I see that keep people away from faith in God. Number one is guilt. Ever heard someone say this? If I came to church, the roof would fall in. Look, it's doing fine. Well, what is that? People, people say, in other words, what they're saying is this. I'm going to keep my distance from God because I've got a sense of guilt on my conscience and I'm just not so sure I should approach Jesus. It could be bad, for, it could be catastrophic for everyone if I approach Jesus. What's that? We keep our distance because of guilt. The other main objection that people have to faith in God that keeps people at a distance is this. How could you believe in a God when there is so much pain and suffering in the world? How many people have got a friend or maybe you've you've had that attitude? How could God be real? How how could God... and, And yet, here's the thing. Jesus, at the whipping post and in his bruising and on the cross, deals with both of those two objections that we have to faith. We say, well, I can't come to God because... The roof would fall in. I've got too much guilt. God wouldn't accept and love me. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. He brings healing to that part of our life. But, but then we say, well, I couldn't believe in God because I've been through so much pain. And yet Jesus was crushed and endured suffering and pain on our behalf. And so when I come to him, I find not a condemning finger. When I come to Jesus with my pain, I find a savior who is willing to heal and restore my soul. Is this encouraging anyone today? Can you see why it's actually important we don't avoid the painful parts in the Bible? And so so we we land at this idea that Jesus actually is able to deal with both. The first Peter 2.25, Peter goes on and then says, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. You see, when you reimagine God to be not some distant deity or some judgmental, harsh figure. 
when you reimagine and see Jesus as he actually is, the one who suffered, bled, and died, now, Peter says, when you see Jesus like that, now you're able to return to the shepherd and the overseer of your soul. When I see what Jesus was willing to go through in order for you and I to be healed, that doesn't harden my heart. That softens my heart. That doesn't repel me from God. That attracts me to God. If that's what God is like, then I could open my heart to a God like that. You know what? I could return to the shepherd and overseer of my soul, Jesus, if he's willing to go through that for me. And so that's why at Calvary, if you come to Calvary Church every Sunday, we're going to point you to God's love and kindness and grace toward you. Because when you see Jesus and what he was willing to do, that's the thing that opens our heart to return to him in faith. Is this helping anyone today? Let me, let me close with this final thought. I want to read one more portion of scripture and then we're going to pray for people today in the service. And you're here and you know that you need to make your peace with God today. In a moment, we're going to pray and make opportunity for that. But let, let me read one final portion from the Bible. This is just before Jesus, is, well, he's on the way to the cross. It says, now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem on the way. He took the 12 aside, that's his 12 closest followers, and said to them, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man, that was Jesus' favorite name for himself, the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. You know what's amazing about that? as we bring this to a close, what's amazing about that is, I don't know about you, but I spend most of my life trying to avoid suffering. So that's why I don't go jogging. Why would I inflict that pain upon myself? I, I, like if there's, if there's stairs or an escalator, I know all the CrossFitters here will be like, I take the stairs. Well, good on you. I take the escalator. Anyone else with me? Any other mere mortals with me? Like Des Mosley, you're a man among boys. Um, if, if, if Sarah says, eh, it's a bit hot in here, can we turn the air con on? I'm not the guy saying, don't turn the air con on. Let's just, no, no, I'm, I'm putting the air con on. Absolutely. Like, if there's a choice between suffering and not suffering, just how many people are choosing not suffering? It's the large majority. If, if you didn't lift your hand, you're going to come next week when I do a special service for you with no air con. <laughs> then see if you change your mind. Why? We're all a bit wired like that, aren't we? Like, given a choice. Here's the amazing thing. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And he knows what awaits him. He knows that when he gets to Jerusalem, he's going to be arrested, flogged, crucified. If that were me, I'd be like, Siri, can you reroute Google Maps? If I know that that's what's awaiting me, I'm going somewhere else. Flip, I'll even go to Victoria. I'll go anywhere. Like, why? I, I reroute. Why, why would I want to go there? And, and, and this is the shocking, amazing thing about not just Easter, but the Christian message. That Jesus wasn't dragged kicking and screaming to the whipping post or to the cross. We don't read that as Jesus is getting flogged, he's saying, excuse me, guys, this is a terrible misunderstanding. We, we don't see Jesus getting dragged to the cross as the unfortunate end to an otherwise promising preaching career. No, no, no. Jesus volunteers himself to go to Jerusalem. Jesus volunteers himself to go to the whipping post. Jesus volunteers himself to go to the cross. Why? Because Jesus chose it. It wasn't pushed upon him. He chose it. And if it's chosen, it must be an act of love. Who knows? It's only love if there's choice involved. If there was no other human beings on the planet, just me and Sarah, and I said to Sarah, I just want you to know, baby, I love you. She would say, you don't have any other options. <laughs> right? What makes it love is that it's a choice. What makes Friday, Good Friday? What makes Easter an act of love, what makes the cross the place where God's love is demonstrated is that it wasn't inflicted upon Jesus, it was chosen by Jesus. There'll be people here today in this service, maybe right up to the back row of the balcony, right to the front. Some of us deep down in our heart, we wonder, does God really love me? Does Jesus really love me? Could, G could Jesus really forgive me? Listen, 
If Jesus didn't love you, he would have never chosen the whipping post. If Jesus didn't want to heal you, he would have never gone to the cross. If Jesus didn't want to forgive you and wash away your past, he would have never gone through the agony of Gethsemane or the nails of Calvary. The cross, the whipping post, the bruising, all of that is the evidence. It's the proof positive that God not only understands you, not only is able to heal you, but he loves you. He chose all of that as an act of love so that you and I could be forgiven by God. We could be healed of the hurts that people see. We could even be healed of the hurts that people don't see. And ultimately, we could be reconciled back to our Creator in a loving relationship. Don't you love Jesus and His goodness toward us? Come on, one more. Why don't we just honour Jesus and His grace and mercy? In fact, why don't we stand to our feet? Let's going to close our eyes. I said a couple of minutes ago that, that we're going to pray, and I want to do that now. So, so I just want to pray that, that God would soften our hearts and, and then the team are going to come and lead us and we're just going to sing for a moment or two that song we sung earlier about his, you know, his groan, my song, his woe, is my rest. And then we're going to give people an opportunity today to make their peace with God. Why, why don't we just close our eyes? If you feel comfortable, why don't you lift your hands to heaven? Jesus, we just thank you today for everything that you suffered so that we could be healed. Jesus, I thank you that you made forgiveness, mercy possible. The, the, the pain of regret we carry, the, the pain of our own sin and failure that we carry. Jesus, I thank you that we don't have to carry it because you carried it on our behalf. Thank you that there is a new beginning available for us. Jesus, I, I pray now for people in church who feel those bruises, the pain beneath the surface. Jesus, I thank you that we don't have to hide that from you, but rather we can bring it to you and you're able to heal restore, make us whole again. Jesus, you're so good to us. We thank you in Jesus' name.